Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Coffee Microcaps uh, morning meeting. Uh, just a quick, uh, we'll run through compliance and disclaimer quickly. Um, for anybody who hasn't met me in person at one of our in-person conferences in Sydney, my name is Mark Tobin. I run Coffee Microcaps, where we try and shine a spotlight on uh, some of the smaller companies on the on the ASX and give them a platform to get their story across to microcap uh, investors. Uh, this is our first uh, Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. Uh, it's going to be happening every fortnight on Thursdays from this time, from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Uh, we've got two companies presenting over the hour. Uh, each is going to get their own 30-minute slot, uh, which is plus minus 20 minutes for uh, for the panelists to run through presentation. Uh, and then we'll have 10 minutes for Q&A. You should be able to see a Q&A function or box. Please type your questions in there, and then we'll uh, endeavor to get to as many of those questions as time allows once the presentations are finished. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel in due course. So if you want to go back and look at the presentation or any particular piece, uh, please do so there. Um, be sure and follow us. Uh, Twitter is our main platform. So you can find us uh, at C Microcaps for anybody who's not following us. As I say, YouTube for the recording of this webinar and all future webinars will be up. So if you can't join us, uh, every time we have one, um, just subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the notifications button, and then it'll pop up whenever new content arrives. LinkedIn, we do some additional content on LinkedIn for anybody who's not following us there. Our first presentation this morning is HDL Limited. Um, I'm delighted to have uh, Mr. Greg Timar, the CEO, um, have have us uh, give us an overview of the HDL story. So I'm going to hand you over to Greg now. Hey, thanks, Mark. That's uh, that's great. Um, hopefully, you can see my um, <coughs> my presentation. Well, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Greg Tima. I'm the CEO of the HDL Group. Um, it's great to be with you this morning. Um, as is uh, um, these unusual times, I'm, uh, I'm talking to you from the study at my house. Um, and uh, I hope everyone on the call today is, uh, um, is well and, and looking after themselves in these, uh, in this, in these unusual times. Um, I've recently joined HGL, um, in fact, last December. Um, and uh, uh, really, uh, I've got a, a long a long career in corporate finance, um, various senior operational roles across various industries, uh, but most recently in private equity. And um, you know, I've come in to really help the business build on its foundations and to create um, a strong and viable uh, future for the business. So maybe first turning to uh, a little bit about uh, who HDL is by way of vision and purpose. So we're an active investment company, um, which directly invests into unlisted small to medium sized businesses. Um, and those are business, businesses who possess a sustainable competitive advantage and strong growth prospects. And we provide our portfolio of businesses, both equity capital and specialist business management skills to leverage um, the growth opportunities in their, in their businesses. Our core purpose is to create shareholder value through active ownership in our portfolio businesses and driving sustainable growth by um, a really strong focus on both customers and employees. So HDL is one of the longest listed companies on the ASX and we recently completed our 116th AGM. Um, it draws on a rich entrepreneurial tradition of investment in various sectors. Through its history, HGL has been an incubator for a number of listed companies, um, including Hunter Hall, which is now part of Pengana Capital, and Clearview. Um, since the 1980s, we've had a close association with two substantial families um, through our shareholder base, who have brought their skills, experience, and support to the operations of the group. Since their involvement, HGL has made over um, 11 substantial investments 
in small cap listed companies, some which have included takeover offers, and 13 private company acquisitions, and, and the two um, listed incubations that uh, I mentioned previously. So today, HDL comprises investments in five portfolio companies. Three of these are 100% owned, being BLC, our beauty and wellness business, JSB, our lighting solutions business, and SPOS, our retail merchandising solutions business. In addition, we own 70% of Pegasus, which is our healthcare product solutions business, principally servicing those requiring disability related equipment. HGL's largest investment, um, though by value, is our 45% stake in the Mount Castle. HGL today continues its long term strategy to partner with owners and managers to maximise the value of businesses through bringing our equity and management skills to bear. Our focus in the near term is on realising the value in our current portfolio, particularly given the recent impacts that um, COVID-19 has meant, not only for our businesses, but also for the wider economy. Um, as of today, all our businesses continue operating, albeit in uncertain conditions. Though in uncertainty, there is opportunity. Um, we're, we are currently in the middle of a one for four rights issue um, that we announced at the end of January at 25 cents per share, which we've extended in the current climate now through to 21 April. This is, this is partially underwritten by our two substantial shareholder groups to the extent of their 53% holding in HGL's equity base. Further information is available in the investor offer booklet available on the ASX website. In joining HGL, the board asked me to lead a strategic review of each of our businesses, which is ongoing. Our efforts, though, will revolve principally around improving sales productivity, including through people and systems initiatives, as well as securing relevant bolt-on brand and M&A opportunities. As with many businesses in the current circumstances, we continue to develop our plans for shoring up our balance sheet. So what makes HGL worth considering for investment? As well as our equity and skills proposition, our current portfolio includes um, companies that display the following attributes. They all have solid reputations in their respective sectors, strong leadership and sector expertise, operate in highly fragmented competitive settings, offering both brand and M&A bolt-on opportunities, potential for continuous improvement, and most importantly, um, display strong operational leverage, um, being the high percentage flow through to the bottom line from incremental revenues. And this really explains our focus on finding and securing preferably already established brands or synergistic bolt-on business opportunities. The most recent case in point is BLC, securing the exclusive license for the hydropeptide brand in Australia for a modest investment in inventory and a new website. Also important is the ongoing supportive and long-term relationship we have with our bankers ANZ. Our investment proposition is further enhanced by a large pool of tax losses of around $29 million, the majority of which are revenue in nature, as well as um, circa $9 million in franking credits. So I'd like to now provide you an introduction to each of our portfolio businesses. Starting with our beauty and wellness business, BLC, this operates as a house of brands. The largest of these by total sales is French brand Falgo, which is where the business commenced in Australia some 45 years ago. We continue to build the portfolio of complementary brands to provide a compelling proposition to our customers, who traditionally have been spas, salons and clinics across Australia, and more recently New Zealand. In addition to this, we continue to build our online presence through direct websites for most of our brands, as well as supporting our select online partners. BLC has added four new premium brands last year and hydropeptide this year. We'll also continue to look at other licensing opportunities. JSB is, a, is largely a B2B business, selling lighting packages to developers, builders and contractors typically on larger commercial projects, and remains a recognised distributor of a broad portfolio of architectural lighting solutions, both in Australia and New Zealand. 
Following the loss of a major brand license in 2018, we have employed a new CEO with significant industry experience and continue to build on our acquisition of the Intralux business. Intralux is our Australian design and manufactured lighting venture based in JSB's Brisbane facilities. It has been successful in gaining market share and now accounts for about 20% of um, JSB's total sales. We believe Intralux has the potential to grow further and be an important anchor of this business. JSB have recently opened um, a contemporary new office in Sydney with a showroom area and have secured new attractive premises for an office and showroom in Melbourne. Um, it's two key markets. The focus this year for JSB will be building customer relationships, deepening and broadening its offer and continuing to build the sales pipeline. We also continue to explore brand and M&A opportunities for this business. SPOS, our retail merchandising business, um, enjoys an A-list client base, including Coles, Woolworths and Aldi, in addition to various other well-known national retailers in both Australia and New Zealand. SPOS provides a broad range of products, including high-quality product fonting solutions, such as roller shelves and push dispensers. Recently, SPOS has been successful in designing and delivering applications of this technology in new retail formats, including for dispensing pharmaceuticals and cigarettes. SPOS have also become leading providers in anti-theft systems through the development of various solutions to boost retailers' profits through reducing in-store theft. While SPOS services retailers, its business drivers are upgrades and new stores, as well as product innovation that improves customer profitability, as opposed to underlying retail sales growth. Under the leadership of its CEO, SPOS has undertaken numerous brand and business acquisitions and has been historically a consistent performer. Work this year in SPOS will focus on driving sales productivity and adding new product opportunities to the offering. Acquired in 2018 and 70% owned by HDL, Pegasus has accumulated an estimated 40% share in the New South Wales public hospital market for alternating pressure mattresses used to manage and prevent bed sores. Pegasus are looking to replicate that success in other key state markets. And this has been built in parallel to its disability equipment solutions business. So Pegasus enjoys good long-term tower wins from the operation of the National Disability Insurance Scheme and the general ageing demographic of the population. Mattresses have been a growth business and Pegasus is reinvesting its cash flows for further growth. Success in the mattresses segment has been based on a combination of clinical excellence of its high quality products, a high touch service proposition, efficient IT delivery and a good value offer. Currently trials are underway for mattresses in major new acute hospitals in both Sydney and Victoria, with a view to potentially securing new contracts. Pegasus is also in advanced negotiations on a small bolt-on acquisition. Turning now to the group's largest investment, Mountcastle. This remains as a joint venture between HGL and CEO James Baldwin, together with other minority interests. Schoolware has been achieving growth from the trend towards greater differentiation between schools, in part in the form of prominent branded uniforms. Mountcastle has mastered a profitable, quick turnaround, short run manufacturing process for both school formal wear and sports wear. Mountcastle through its two overseas joint venture manufacturing facilities controls a high quality, profitable, vertically integrated supply chain. At the end of last year, Mountcastle acquired Sydney based LW Reed. Established in 1922, LW Reed has, under the leadership of CEO Brad Orish, um, has become one of the leading distributors of schoolware in Australia. Each of Mountcastle and LW Reed are looking to continue to operate largely as they have, with integration occurring in relation to certain systems and processes. Each business will look to leverage the other's strengths to drive sales and win new business. We're excited by progress in the now enlarged Mount Castle business and the opportunities this will provide to grow further in the sector. By way of further background, the rationale for the LW Reed acquisition, 
A number of considerations made LW Reed a compelling proposition for Mount Castle. LW Reed has a broader national sales footprint um, with a bias towards public primary schools. And this complements well Mount Castle's smaller, though deeper customer base with a bias towards private schools in Queensland and New South Wales. Now selling to over 30% of all schools in the country, LW Reed brings know-how on delivering timely and cost-effective product to school uniform shops through a sophisticated online and phone-based marketing platform with tech-driven fulfillment. While the acquisition of LW Reed was largely funded by debt, this was in circumstances that Mountcastle had little leverage. It provided an opportunity, therefore, to use debt well, while still leaving the merge business conservatively geared. LW Reed was able to be acquired at an attractive acquisition metric. With a partly deferred settlement, the balance of purchase proceeds is to be funded by the ANZ, subject to meeting loan conditions at the time of payment. The CEO of LW Reed is aligned to the success of the broader business, having taken a minority stake in the Mount Castle Group. I'd like to turn now quickly to last year's financial performance. Our merchandising business, SPOS, performed in line with historical results in 2019, after 2018 benefiting from a stronger Australian dollar and some one-off adjustments. Our lighting solutions business, JSB, saw the, the full year impact of the loss of the major brand licence, which I referred to earlier. The rebuild of this business is underway and a significant focus for us during 2020. Our beauty and wellness business, BLC, saw its operating loss widen on the prior year. However, work is progressing and turning around this business with the benefit of scale from additional brands introduced last year and with hydropeptide added so far this year. 2019 was the first full year of Pegasus's earnings, with prior year representing HDL's half year of ownership only. A fall in EBIT margin for this business was as a result of the growth in the rental based mattress business and associated depreciation related expenses. Mountcastle had the most pleasing result last financial year with revenue growth of almost 25% with an increase in EBIT margin. Over the next 12 months, we will be refining our views on each of the businesses through the strategic review process. We are satisfied that we have growth opportunities for each of our investments once we return to normal operating conditions. As indicated earlier, we are now undertaking work to further strengthen our balance sheet through this period of uncertainty. I look forward to speaking with parties in the future. Please, by all means, drop me a line to introduce yourself um, and in keeping with today's theme, um, a virtual cup of coffee. I'd be pleased to take the time to, uh, to talk with you. The balance of the presentation really provides bios on each of our chair and key executives. Um, as well as my contact details. And, um, I'll allow you to sort of go through that um, at your leisure. But I uh, wanted to say thank you for your time and uh, look forward to, uh, to any questions that you might have. Um, so, so, Mark, it looks like that uh, we, uh, we don't have any open questions at this stage. Not at this um, time, but uh, I think, uh, Greg, I'll just uh, kick off on one. I guess yeah, sure. maybe maybe if you could quickly run through the businesses and just highlight which ones are more impacted by COVID nineteen, I guess, and and which ones are are less impacted, and and kind of what those impacts are, because it's quite a diverse range of businesses with you know different supply chains, um, you know different peak seasons in terms of revenues and and turnovers. So maybe if you quickly run through each of those and how they've been affected. If yeah, all. great, great question. No, thanks, Mark. Um, so, look, as mentioned earlier in the presentation, each of our businesses um, continue to operate, um, and like many, um, our employees are largely working from home. So, most impacted um, by COVID nineteen has really been our beauty and wellness business, BLC, um, whose traditional customers, being spas, salons, and clinics have been required to, uh, to close um, under, uh, under government um, uh, um, requirements. Um, so look, uh, we continue to uh, run that business largely via online sales. Um, 
and uh, that business has also undertaken a, a pretty significant um, reduction in hours across the board of its employees um, with effect from uh, the beginning of this month. Um, JSB, um, which is our lighting solutions business, and SPOS, um, which is our uh, retail merchandising business, um, they really depend on the ongoing operation of the building industry to ensure sales. So while the building sector continues to operate in key markets, um, which is great, um, both have experienced a drop in demand, um, though uh, both those businesses have also um, um, uh, cut back on their staff hours to um, you know, right size the um, uh, costs of the business to, to revenues. Pegasus, which is our disability solutions business, um, has really experienced um, only sort of minor reductions in sales, um, principally um, from walk-ups to our key showrooms. Um, the mattress business um, continues to perform well. Um, and as mentioned in the presentation, Pegasus has really been active in securing new contract opportunities, both uh, here in New South Wales and in Victoria. Um, with respect to our largest business, Mountcastle, um, which is the school wear and corporate wear business. Um, its business is really um, a, uh, has experiences an annual sales cycle, um, which is heavily focused um, at the beginning of the school year. So somewhat luckily, um, uh, Mountcastle has been able to see through its back to school selling period and that's been, um, has been a, um, a success um, and, and largely unim unimpacted by COVID-19. Um, notwithstanding that uh, now schools have uh, closed across the country. Um, so um, for now, that, uh, that business is, uh, is, is looking um, uh, quite strong. So across the various businesses, like many, um, we've, uh, we've registered for the various federal and state government um, support initiatives. Um, and uh, where successful, this could have a, um, a material impact um, for, the, for the group. Um, and importantly, ANZ um, has been supportive of the business, um, allowing us to um, continue to operate um, our various credit facilities. Um, so that's a, a, a quick once over the top lightly um, on COVID. Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, if we don't have any further questions for Greg, um, I think we we'll leave it there. Greg, thank you very much for your time and that um, overview. And is there any final questions before we um, take a quick break? Because we're a little ahead of time. I'll just give it a second. No, okay, we don't have, we don't have any others. Okay. Um, I'll stop sharing now. Okay, no problem. Thank you, Greg. Okay, we are slightly ahead of time. So we're just gonna wait uh, a couple of minutes for our next speaker to to join so if everybody can just uh, hang tight for two minutes that'd be great thank you okay we have our second presenter here with us now and um, i'm delighted actually are going to give a special mention to our next presenter which is dr chris hart from Aventus. Um, Chris is joining us uh, from California, so I think it's very late in the day for, for Chris his side, so I appreciate him taking the time to speak to us. So I'm just going to hand over to Chris now, and uh, Chris, if you could just uh, share your screen so we can run through your presentation, that'd be great. Yeah, no problem. I'd need you to hand over. There we go. All right. I trust uh, everyone can now see my screen. Can you hear me loud and clear? Um, yes, you sound fine to me, Chris. Okay, great. All right, Mark. Well, listen, thanks uh, for the invitation to present and thanks everyone that's online as well. Um, obviously, a brave new world um, and an exciting time, actually, uh, you know, Adversity brings opportunity, and I think that um, while short term there's been some challenges, I think for us as at Aventus, uh, 2020 is going to continue to be a very exciting year. <clears throat> so I'll, we only got 20 minutes or so, so I'll 
be quite brief, um, but try to click down on areas that would be of interest. I'll assume some understanding of obstructive sleep apnea in the market opportunity. I'll then spend a little bit of time talking about our lab in lab business model and our technology, as well as how uh, I guess we've um, manoeuvred or um, uh, pivoted in response to COVID-19 and the opportunities that have presented themselves as a result of that. Um, so obstructive sleep apnea occurs when you're sleeping. You stop breathing multiple times. Um, it has massive uh, long-term health and socioeconomic impacts, billions of dollars um, each year um, if it's left untreated. Um, in America, there's uh, 30 million sleep apneas. I moved to America as the world's biggest market for sleep apnea. I brought my family over here to roll out um, our technology and our lab in lab program. The standard of care um, is CPAP, so the fighter pilot mask with the reverse phase vacuum cleaner. We know that it works, um, but it's not well tolerated. Um, out of 100 patients that are diagnosed with sleep apnea, 35 will refuse it outside, outright. Half of them will take one home and half of them will uh, quit therapy within the first year. So uh, as a result of that, uh, there are 3 million patients that have been diagnosed in North America um, and are outside of care. And then a further 20, uh, 23 million patients or 24 million patients that are yet to be diagnosed. One of the main reasons patients fail uh, CPAP and also the alternate therapy of mouth guards is nasal obstruction. Blocked nose uh, leads to mouth breathing. Mouth breathing leads to a full face mask, which requires higher pressure, leaks and discomfort. Uh, tightening of straps requires more pressure, it pushes the jaws back and the patient throws the mask off. With an oral appliance, um, we can stop the tongue from flopping jack back by bringing, bringing the jaw forward, but again, when the mouth opens, treatment fails. I was one of those patients, so I was a very severe sleep apnea and nasal obstructor. Uh, out of desperation, I developed a mouth guard for myself from a dentist by trade that had an airway in it. You can see down the bottom of the screen there, we have a 3D airway that allows air to flow through the middle of the mouth guard to the mouth closed, and it then goes below the nose and soft palate, which are two high level levels of obstruction that mouth guards can't deal with normally. Um, and CPAP actually makes nasal obstruction worse in many cases. This is the only therapy that treats the entire airway by bypassing nose and soft palate, reducing overall collapsibility and allowing the air to flow. We're having very similar effects. To CPAP. We've run four clinical trials, over 200 patients, three journal articles peer reviewed, three accepted for publication, and another three in draft. We show the technology to sleep physicians who treat sleep apnea there. Um, very excited by the opportunity now that they have a mouth guard with comparable uh, clinical outcomes to CPAP. We also know that our mouth guards are worn nearly twice as much as CPAP on our clinical trials, and we've increased the success rate of a standard mouth guard from 56% now to 80% with our airway. And also with that little flapper valve, you see um, when a patient switches to mouth breathing now, instead of a treatment for failing, the patient's own mouth breathing becomes a CPAP. That little flapper valve acts as a ratchet pump and it inflates the airway. Um, and we're showing phenomenal success rates with that across our clinical trials. That's really exciting to sleep physicians. They now have a viable CPAP alternative that they can attend. Uh, for us, even those three million patients that are outside of care that are diagnosed free, that's a $2 billion opportunity. That market's growing at very high uh, CAGAR. And there are a lot of people looking for alternative treatments other than CPAP. For many sleep physicians, um, they are now prescribing the O2 and O2 and Optima as a first line of treatment um, because they now have a, a mouth guard with efficacy above 70%, which is what they've been looking for for quite some time. So why do oral appliances only constitute 10% of the therapeutic market? Well, the first reason is that they haven't always worked that well. And we've overcome that now by increasing efficacy to CPAP-like levels for 80% or more of patients. The other issue was the siloing of professions where the sleep physician is managing the sleep apnea, but the dentist is the point of reimbursement and care for an oral appliance. So patients would leave the sleep physician's room and get lost to follow up. Uh, and the third is competing economic imperatives. If you say to a sleep doc, look, why don't you use oral appliances more often? They say it's because they don't always work. We show them the data. They then say, great, where can we get it? Well, the good news is we can put a 3D scanner, intraoral scanner within your clinic and you can deliver it here and manage the care yourself with the assistance of a dentist. Then if we look at the competing economic imperatives, they'll say, well, if I refer for an oral appliance, the patient walks out the door, never be seen again, and the dentist shows them for $3,000. If you say to a dentist, why don't you do more sleep apnea treatment? They say, well, whenever I refer a patient for a sleep study, uh, they end up on CPAP and I never see them again. So what we've done is we've taken um, our program, uh, because we're a digital workflow company, we don't require a full dental clinic. All we need is a little one scanner. And if you see on the, in that middle photo there on the desk, there's a little one 
we wave that around inside the mouth and that replaces the dental clinic. So we're placing the scanners in sleep physicians' uh, facilities, sleep labs and in DME distributors. And now if the sleep physician says, look, you could have CPAP or you could have an APT and Optima, it's going to be just as effective for you. Uh, and you can be scanned uh, next door if you choose to go next door and get scanned. In doing so then, we have true shared care. So we have a collaborative model where the sleep facility and the dentist are sharing in the care of the patient and also the revenue streams. So we're increasing revenue for all stakeholders here. We're simplifying the patient journey and we have the what really is the most effective treatment on market. It's 80% as effective as CPAP worn almost twice as much. So the mean disease alleviation is very high. And on top of that, we have existing CPT codes uh, for reimbursement, including with Medicare patients, who are patients uh, funded by the government. Uh, they're usually 60 years and older. And interestingly, they're the ones at most risk of COVID-19. So what's driving adoption of the lab and lab model? Well, first and foremost, the technology. We now have um, a legitimate displacement for CPAP in the OTVN Optima. It also simplifies the patient journey and looks after the patient first and foremost and increases revenue and profit for both the sleep channel and the dental channel. Uh, and it's a collaborative framework for everyone to work in the best interest of the patients and to share in the revenue streams for providing that uh, very high level of care. When we first launched this um, model, we actually didn't even have uh, FDA clearance for the Optima. And we had contracts signed ahead of clearance. So you can see there in July last year, we already had uh, two contracts signed across a number of sites. And then that's grown significantly through to February. And it's actually increased again since then. Um, you know, we have now 43 sites contracted across 11 contracts. And we have a funnel um, of hundreds of uh, sites that we're in discussions with as well. So um, we expect that funnel to keep growing. And in fact, the demand for both the technology and the business model, the clinical model, has accelerated significantly uh, since COVID-19. And I'll explain uh, a few reasons why that's the case. So here's our growth. Uh, in July, we had um, a few number of sites contracted, 15. Now we have 43 in February. Um, we have many more sites we're negotiating on. What we have done is we, we are continuing to launch sites even with stay-at-home um, guidance uh, and social distancing. We've very quickly switched to an online model. So the sleep physicians managing their patients switch to telehealth very quickly, and we've done the same. We're plugging into the telehealth systems and providing online support uh, to walk a patient through the journey up until the point where they need to be, need to be scanned. Uh, so we're continuing to negotiate contracts and we're continuing to finalise those negotiations and we're continuing to launch sites. We can't physically scan uh, in some of our sites at the moment, although many of them are continuing to operate. Uh, but what we are doing is we're front-loading our launch program so that when we open back up again in the next uh, month or two, we should have twice as many sites ready to go at the same time as we're doing all the preparations ahead of the time when patients can attend on those sites again. Having said that, as I said, many states are still operating um, as this can be deemed essential treatment to maintain someone's airway. This is our patient flow leading into COVID-19. Um, we had launched sites with annualised revenue at minimum quotas, and we have in these agreements with the sleep facilities um, we have minimum quotas of 20 devices a month. It can take one to two quarters to get to that level. But at that level, the sites we'd launched would have $3 million annualised revenue. And the sites contracted, which are 43, would have $10 million annualised revenue. The number of sites we're negotiating with, in actual fact, uh, would represent around $60 million of annualised revenue at the moment. So what we're doing now that the patients uh, aren't coming to the clinic in all locations, instead of the sleep physician referring for a scan, uh, they get online, they're already online, they're doing a telehealth consult, they click on the uh, schedule button and schedule a telehealth consultation with us. We're doing the patient intake online, verifying insurance and then booking a scan uh, in the various sites when they're scheduled to reopen according to the guidelines by region. So um, last week the American Dental Association came out and said that uh, elective procedures should be postponed. The US Center for Medicare and Medicaid um, expanded telemedicine coverage so now we can do uh, telemedicine across borders uh, it's now been uh, put into law that the services need to be remunerated at the same level as a face-to-face -face, and the service needs to be maintained at the same level the american academy of, academy of sleep medicine noted that um, patients with covid or at risk of covid or being exposed to should not use cpap in shared dwellings uh, because of aerosol spread and the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine advised the provision of oral appliance therapy when CPAP can't be used to be made on a case-by-case -case basis. So we have the opportunity there if the sleep physician wishes the patient to be treated, we can scan the patient and indeed are in many states 
This is just an excerpt from the AASM site um, and from the AADSM site. And this um, this part, this presentation is on our, our website as well. It was like the ASX. Standard precautions we use in dentistry anyway. Um, so we protect against HIV, AIDS, A, B, and C. So uh, COVID-19 is just another pathogen, and we use the same precautions as we would otherwise. Only difference being, I suspect that there will be a change that all clinics will need to be disposable, as opposed to wearing a comic coat uh, for more than one patient. But other than that, the same precautions remain in place. So our lab and lab partners have been phenomenal. Um, they switched to telehealth rapidly. We plugged into that. We're scheduling patients constantly now. In fact, any patients that we weren't able to see in the last three weeks of March, we already have rescheduled and we're scheduling additional patients to contact for that through May, June, April, May and June. Uh, we're hopeful that with the launch of their planning and the patients we're scheduling, we should be back on track with our revenue growth by the end of the June quarter. Um, that's a hope. And at the moment, that looks um, uh, probable for now. Um, the sleep groups are continuing to, ide to identify patients. We're providing online assistance and we're managing through that journey so that when we come back online, we should have more appointments with patients ready to be scanned for an O2 down optima. Um, <clears throat> if home sheltering and social distancing uh, makes attending the facility a challenge, we've actually also fast track and we're launching at the moment a home care model. So instead of the patient coming into the facility to be scanned, the scanners are mobile, we can take it to the home and scan them in the home as well. So telehealth combined to home care now gives us much greater access to patients. There's been a cultural shift towards uh, telehealth and home care because of COVID-19. And a lot of fav factors are actually in our favour to expand this across the country quite rapidly throughout 2020. This is just a consultation being done in a home, a hygienist uh, attending to scan a patient for a divider with the dentist via telehealth as well. So we're basically uber sleep now. Um, you know, this opportunity really has opened up for us to be the uh, Uber team uh, in North America. Medicare reimbursement is incredibly important. Um, we don't require pre-authorization of insurance. We get paid in 13 days instead of 60, and there's 64 million people who um, are eligible to have their treatment paid for by Medicare. So that combined with our recent agreement, we announced with Aeroflow, who are a fast regional, fast growing regional group, uh, soon to become national. Um, we've now mapped out our rollout plan with them through the rest of um, 2020, and we're very excited that uh, we've partnered with them and have a lot of work to do. We're working on it again today. Um, they have great synergies with us. They are already doing uh, telehealth delivery of CPAP, so we're just going to put uh, Optima into those same platforms. And uh, they're marketing across the country. They have um, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of patients across the country that they're starting to um, market our, our product offering to and our we also instituted significant cost savings, so we suspected things might slow down, and that has been the case. We think there will be a 30 to 60 day shift in booked revenue, although we still had solid growth in the March quarter, and we're hoping to grow um, revenues again in the June quarter and, and accelerating through into the back end of 2020. We've reduced our cash burn by over a third. We come into the, this quarter with, uh, rev, with um, cash reserves to take us into the back end of the year. And we're continuing to grow our lab in lab program and we have a very low cost base now as everything's gone virtual with greatly reduced marketing travel costs and we're highly scalable uh, with very little um, capex required so we're very excited about the opportunity that has presented as a result of COVID-19. Great board and I'll go through this quickly because we're running out of time. Um, we do have a, uh, a fantastic team in the US that's helped us um, launch this program we're very excited about that as well. Um, and we have an advisory board. All of these guys are involved in our lab and lab program at the moment, and they're helping us uh, spread the word throughout the industry as well. Um, we have 130 million shares on offer. Um, the share price has come off quite a bit. Um, having said that, you know, we don't see any structural reason in the economy or within the company for that to be the case. As I said, we'll have um, solid cash. We have solid cash reserves. We're able to trade through the back end of 2020. We have enormous demand for the product. Um, you know, we have enough contracts signed now to operate through the rest of the year and get past cash flow break even on the new cost base. Um, we also have uh, many times that in the funnel for negotiation and closing. So um, we have a unique product offering and a new, unique clinical business um, model in the world's largest market with a multi-billion dollar opportunity uh, with the oral appliance part of that market is set to grow at 20 to 25% CAGA. So, um, you know, I think we're very well positioned to come out of COVID-19 very strongly and accelerate through the end of the year and beyond. So the technology is clinically validated as the most effective oral appliance for sleep apnea. Uh, the treatment outcomes are comparable to CPAP and it's the only technology that treats the entire airway. It's a true market disruptor and it's been recognised as such by 
We have a massive unmet medical need. Um, the market's worth $3 billion. It's forecast to continue to grow substantially. We're a commercial stage company. Um, there's no clinical uh, trial inflection point or regulatory risk. We have existing reimbursement codes. We have approvals to sell in North America and, in fact, globally outside of China. Um, we've got demonstrated adoption with lab and lab contracts signed with minimum quotas. As I said, launch sites uh, at minimum quotas will be worth $3 million a year. Contracted sites, $10 million a year. And with our forecast cash burn, that's well past cash flow break even. Um, we've been able to um, adjust very quickly. When I took over as CEO a year and a half or so ago, one of the things I did very quickly was to remove all fixed costs. We're a very flexible company and we've got we're a virtual company. So we can adapt to the new normal of COVID and beyond. And I think many of the workflows that we've introduced will become permanent, particularly uh, the telehealth aspect where we're now managing the patient through their journey. Um, and it's now become highly scalable um, as scanners are mobile and telehealth can be delivered anywhere. So uh, with Medicare funding in place and a fantastic partner in Aeroflow, um, any barriers to um, acceleration and expansion really have been removed. So we're incredibly excited about 2020. Patients are first and foremost, we get great feedback from our patients. We've had fantastic feedback from sleep physicians. Um, you know, we really do, I think, have a unique opportunity to change the way patients are treated for sleep apnea in North America. So I've actually now come in two minutes ahead of time um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hi Chris, that's great, thank you. We actually have two questions from the audience, so let me just put them to you in, in turn. Um, do you manufacture and supply to suppliers or is the model more about licensing your IP and partners offer the full solution under their own label? So we manufacture as an outsource manufacturer. So we really are a data management digital design company and also a clinical management, uh, virtual clinical management company. So um, our virtual clinical model um, manages the patient remotely. We receive the data in Brisbane, the device case designed in Brisbane. Um, for the Australasian market, it's printed in Sydney. They're 3D printed in nylon. And for the North American market, they're printed in Oregon. They're then shipped back to the sleep facility or to the dentist, as the case may be. Um, so we are a manufacturer, but we're an outsourced manufacturer. We still have 80% um, gross profit margin scale, even as an outsourced manufacturer, and we have no fixed costs in the line of uh, in the supply line. And our supply lines are intact. The only thing that crosses the borders for us is data, um, and printing is the same cost no matter where you do it. So, so we actually are very well positioned um, for any issues to trade that come up. Um, in the foreseeable future. Okay, and then the, the second question is actually a two-part question, but let me give it to you. Is the InMount scanner a unique Aventus solution or an already existing technology? And then if it is an Aventus solution, is there opportunities to use the technology for use in other InMount products? So um, it's not an Aventus solution. Um, there are a number of scanners on the market. Um, and we use the scanner that is best for the situation. Um, the, they were already developed. You know, if you think about Invisalign, a small direct club, they have a similar workflow but a different business model. Um, they're a cash pay marketing machine. Um, we're a, a professionally marketed medical device business, fully reimbursed, or not fully reimbursed, but 80% reimbursed on average in the US. Um, so, but that workflow is existing. Um, we can procure those scanners at great prices and place them wherever the patient may be. So that's a real opportunity for us. And then I had a, a question myself. In terms of the clinics that you're uh, engaging with, dealing with, are, can you give us a, a kind of a geographic sense of where they are? I mean, are they just in America? Are they just on the West Coast? Or, you know, is this across Canada, the US, Australia, like all those clinics that you're, you talked about in the funnel, a sense of where all of those um, guys are placed? Sure. So the ones we've contracted, so I'll go through the ones we've launched first. Um, we have a number in Canada, in the greater Toronto area, in Ontario, and also in Alberta. We have a number in California. Um, we have uh, some sites in Texas, in Illinois, uh, in South Carolina. Um, now that's expanding very quickly. Um, in terms of sites contracted, we also have um, on many other states, um, the New England region, um, we have um, uh, Colorado, um, North Carolina, Kentucky, Tennessee, there's, there's sites all over the country. In terms of in the 
funnel. I mean, it's the whole of North America and actually Australia as well. Uh, and we haven't gone to Europe yet, but it's mostly Australia and North America. So we're rolling out at the moment one clinic a week on average, um, and that will continue through COVID-19, although the physical scans are being scheduled for when patients are able to move again or if need be, we'll implement the home care platform. In fact, we've implemented it already. Um, that's ready to go. So, um, you know, we can continue to roll out at the rate of one a week through 2020. It is a bit lumpy because of this COVID we'll probably do. Instead of doing four um, in April, we might do eight in, in April and May, for instance. It might be it'll probably be the second half of April before we go live with scanning again in some sites that we're aiming to launch. Um, but, yeah, we have a, an enormous amount of demand. We do not have a demand side problem. Um, you know, we're having to run pretty hard to meet meet, uh, meet demand. To be honest with you. It's, it's, um, it has actually exploded because of COVID-19 as well as um, sleep groups are uh, looking to fill the revenue gap that's occurred. So they will sit, switch to home sleep testing instead of in-lab. And there's a vast difference in reimbursement on that basis. So the, the revenue gap is being filled by many of these sites by introducing our lab in lab program. Also in areas of Canada, reimbursement for CPAP was reduced by several hundred dollars. And that's why we're getting a lot of interest out of Canada as well at the moment. And um, we would expect to see some good movement in contracts and launches as a result of both COVID-19 and um, changes to reimbursement. Okay, I think you might have uh, addressed it, Chris, in the, the presentation, but if you wouldn't mind just go, going back over it quickly. Um, it's in relation to uh, existing cash and your uh, estimate of, uh, you know, where cash flow break even is our, 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 our funding requirements, I guess, over the next um, year, 18 months. If we could just touch on that again. Sure. So um, we reduced our cash burn by a third in the March quarter. Um, so we would forecast a cash burn of $3 million. It came in well under that. Um, there'll be, I think, around 4.2 cash at bank at the end of the quarter on that basis and that's in market we have no we haven't released our 4c but we've we have released it we've reduced our cash burn by more than a third um and then our new cash burn is it will remain low um so as well past two quarters of cash and we'd expect to continue to grow revenue um through the year and that'll take us into the back end of the year okay and then uh, another question from me um given your base there in the states um what kind of uh, makeup is your shareholder register? Do you, do you have a lot of uh, American um, shareholders on there, um, or um, you know, the makeup between any institutional shareholders that have have come on board since uh, since I guess this ramp up has started? Yeah, so we actually have a really solid register. Um, you know, the top twenty and founders uh, represent. 60% or thereabouts of the registry. We've got about 11 uh, institutional investors on the register. Um, I don't want to name them all because I might forget someone. Um, but, uh, you know, for instance, Thorny have been there um, from the start and they're the next biggest shareholder after myself. Um, and there's a number, number of other funds as well um, who are coming um, on successive rounds. So we have a, a really strong register uh, in terms of such a small company on the ASX. We do have some American investors. They're generally high net worth or clinicians that are delivering technology. Um, we do have an enormous amount of interest from US institutional investors, but we're not big enough for them to come in at this stage. Uh, so, but when you know, we do grow to the company to that point, um, there has been a phenomenal interest from US investors in both the device and the clinical business. And in fact, you know, they all, they all say consistently that if it was just a device, we love the device, it looks great. But now that you've got the clinical business model as well, that's a game changer. Um, that's something that will really open up the market. And US investors can see that. Uh, they're just looking for an opportunity to get a stock in a meaningful way. Okay. Okay, Chris, we don't have any further questions at this time. I'll just give... Uh any of our attendees who want to put in one last question to Chris, I'll wait for uh, 15 or 30 seconds if you want to put one last question to him. No, okay, Chris, we don't have any further questions. Um, thank you very much for joining us. I know it's uh, late in the day um, in California, so thank you for uh, participating and um, we'll uh, follow the story with interest. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Mark, and thanks everyone for being online.
Okay, that concludes our Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. I'd like to thank everyone who dialed in for, for dialing in. Um, as I said, these are going to be fortnightly moving forward. So if you want to mark in your calendars, Thursday, two weeks, and 9 a.m., we'll have another two companies presenting in a very similar format. So that's Thursday, the 23rd of April. Um, I will announce the two companies in due course. And if you have any questions or feedback on today's call, please drop me an email at mark at coffeemicrocaps.com. Okay, thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Have a good day and uh, I'll let people go now before we get into the opening of the morning match.